You're listening to the Knowledge Archives podcast. Welcome to the Knowledge Archives podcast. We are a group of students on a mission to learn from as many different disciplines of knowledge as possible. I'm your host, Madhav Malhotra, and today I'm glad to be joined by Dr. Alexander Smith, Associate Professor of Social Science and Policy Studies at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute in the U.S. His research focuses on behaviors like altruism, trust, and cooperation, which he analyzes through the lens of behavioral economics and game theory. I'm very excited to learn more about his experiments and what they can tell us about their behavior in real life. So thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me a little bit more about your research, and I'm really excited to hear about some of these very specialized areas of economics today. But to begin, I'd just love to ask you to introduce yourself quickly and explain how you got started with the line of research that you're looking into. Sure, sure. Sounds good. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. My, my name is Alex Smith. I'm an associate professor of economics at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts. I'm a, a member of the social science department there. So you asked how I got interested in what I do. I do decision-making experiments. I'm an experimental economist, and that feeds into my research on behavioral economics, which is very much about the psychology of decision-making. And specifically, I do a lot of work on pro-social behaviors. So these are things like cooperation and trust and altruism, you know, the willingness to work well with others. The, the reason that I got into that was because as an undergrad, I studied traditional economics, which is based on the assumption that everyone is self-interested and does, does what's best for him or herself. And as I got into grad school, I had an appreciation for the traditional models, but I also realized that they weren't quite right. So I became interested in, in how to incorporate some psychology into economics in order to do a better job of prediction. And so, for example, if you want to understand why somebody would volunteer their time or give money to charity, I mean, you just have to move away from that model where everyone is self-interested. And it was a desire to do that that really got me into my research on, on behavioral and experimental economics. I think that's really interesting to hear about, especially given how this really gets at the foundational level of the assumptions that we use in economic models and tries to think about, well, if these might be a little bit different, if something changes, then what happens? And I know a bunch of your experiments are focused on public goods. So if I understand this correctly, the reason why it's important to study this pro-social behavior when it comes to public goods is because public goods are often a part of economics where the goods aren't allocated enough resources to, with the fundamental reason being they're non-excludable, which just means that people are able to use a public good without paying for it. So why would you pay for it? And examples include like roads, lighthouses, all that. And you're studying how we get people to cooperate together and provide these public goods. What are the types of decisions that they make, they can make in considering factors like cooperation, altruism, all that. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely correct. So I, I think you've done a lot of the work for me on, on that issue. To echo some of what you just explained, with, with public goods, there are actually two key characteristics. So as you said, there's non-excludability. So a public good is a good where you can't exclude anyone from consumption. That's one characteristic. And the other characteristic is that there's non-rivalry in consumption. So the fact that you consume it doesn't mean that I can't consume it too. And when you have goods with those characteristics, these are goods such as a clean and safe neighborhood, or you mentioned a lighthouse, or national defense, or maybe environmental quality more generally, like a clean lake or a a nice forest or something like that, there's this provision problem, right? So if you have a good, a, a private good, where you can't exclude people from consumption, and there is rivalry in consumption, then everybody's got a private incentive to provide it to themselves. With the public good, you you just don't have that incentive. And so 
people want to have the good, but it's not clear who's going to step up and provide it. So the, the challenge with public goods, you know, like roads and schools and a healthcare system is that as a society, we want to have it, but typically, well, often you don't have sufficient private incentives to get provision of the good. And when it comes to this issue of people not having the right incentives, could we quickly talk about some of the stakeholders involved in making the decisions to provide this good? Yeah, we should talk about that. So with many private goods, individual consumers have sufficient incentive to go and, and buy the good themselves. And so producers will meet the needs of consumers in the typical way. You go to a market, you buy what you want to have, and there's a producer who's willing to sell it to you. And it's really easy. But with public goods, the private incentive is often not sufficient. And this is what introduces the role for government. So in the case of a public good, you often need some government help in order to get provision. And the way that that works is private consumers pay taxes and then the government uses tax revenue to, in, to in a way, act collectively on behalf of the people to provide these public goods that people aren't just going to manage to provide on their own because they can't solve the collective action problem. So it's the government stepping in and using tax revenue to finance things like roads and environmental quality and national security. It's the government stepping in that allows the country to have those goods. So in the case of public goods, there is a very clear role for government that does not exist with, with many private goods. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about these incentives, I think the last major thing that uh, is important to talk about is how do we observe these incentives, say in case studies of real life examples of public goods, but then also in, in the lab, in theoretical models of how we study people making decisions from the lens of different stakeholders when it comes to the provision of these goods? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a great question. I like it because it allows me to segue into what I do in the lab. But let, let me try to take things in order. So in the real world, let's think about maybe a public good like a city park. So if you have a, a park, maybe it's Central Park in New York City, members of the public like to go there and enjoy a clean and safe park. And so that's their incentive to, let's say, not litter. You know, the challenge is that sometimes privately, the benefit of not picking up litter, you know, being lazy because it's easy, dominates what's in the interest of the community. And so people go ahead and, and drop their litter because it's the easy thing to do personally. And the private benefit that you get is just not sufficient to get you to choose the right action. So that's the, the individual incentive problem is that privately, you don't expend the time or energy or effort that you need to do what's in the collective interest because privately, the, the incentive just isn't there. And so this is what creates the role for government to step in and say, hire some staff that are going to go around and clean up the park because the government has the interest of society in mind and realizes that collectively we want to have a clean park. And so you just pay a handful of people to tidy up and then that solves the collective action problem. So, so that addresses the, the sort of incentive problem at the individual level. So in the lab, I can recreate that type of situation where there's this incentive problem to provide the public good privately. And actually, maybe I should talk a little bit about how I do things in the lab. So I, I run decision-making experiments. You know, traditionally, when experiments started 30, 40 years ago, they were run using pencil and paper. But now we do these decision-making experiments in a computer lab. So everybody's sitting at a computer and they make their decisions electronically but I give everybody some money and then they decide what they want to do with their money. And if you want to capture the public good incentive problem, we use what's called the public good game. So everybody gets some money 
and then they decide how much of it they want to keep privately and how much they want to contribute to, let's call it a group account, some common project or agenda that's shared by, by every member of a group. And what happens when you make a contribution to the group account is that the return that you get privately is lower than what you would get from just keeping the money for yourself. But the thing is that your contribution to the group, it benefits everyone in the group. So collectively, the group is better off if people contribute. But now we've got this incentive problem where privately, I just want to keep all my money for myself. But collectively, the group is better off if everybody contributes. And so, so you observe how much, uh, how much money people put into the group account, which is your way of capturing how many people clean up their own litter in the park. So it's an abstract setting, but it strips out, you know, some of the complexities of the real world in order to focus in on the key incentives with a collective action problem where people's private interest is to do something different from what's in society's best interest. Mm -hmm. And when I was looking at uh, your research papers, it was really interesting to see how you study a lot more in terms of the factors that are involved when it comes to how these incentives play out. Just reading like a quick list, I saw that you were looking at what changes in terms of the games and decisions being repeated, the number of people with access to the good, their beliefs about do other people cooperate with them. Could you talk about all of these incentives that you're studying and some of the results that you found when one of these factors changes, what happens to the decisions people make? Sure, sure. Well, let me start by saying that it's a, it's a stylized fact or a well-known result in the literature that even though self-interested people wouldn't contribute anything to the public good in the type of game that I just described a few minutes ago, people do tend to contribute. They contribute quite a bit. So we actually do get behavior that's in the collective interest, which is interesting, but we don't really know why. And so we do have a look at, you know, what are the factors underlying the contribution levels that we observe. And I've done a lot of work on beliefs. So one result that's known is that if you think other people will contribute moderate or high amounts, then you tend to make moderate or high contributions yourself. And so there's this relationship between what you think others will do and what you choose to do yourself in terms of contributing to the public good. So we know that, that's an empirical fact, but then it's like, well, what's the nature of the relationship? What's the story behind it? So is it that if you think others are gonna do it, you do it because you think it's the right thing to do? So that's like a social norm story, where if you think the appropriate thing to do in the situation is to match the behavior of others, then that's what you do. That's one explanation that could underlie the relationship between people's behavior and their beliefs about what others will do. But it's not the only potential explanation. So it could be that it could be that you care about inequality, or, or I should say you have a preference for, for equity, right? And so if you care about equity and you know that others are going to contribute a lot, then the way to get equitable outcomes is for you to contribute as well so that you don't end up keeping all your money for yourself and also getting benefits from the contributions of others and they don't get any benefit from you because you were self-interested. So yeah, I have done a fair bit of, of research on working on the factors that underlie contribution decisions and specifically on the beliefs question. One of my contributions was that the correlation between beliefs and actions was identified 10, 15 years ago. And one of my papers identified a causal effect between beliefs and contributions. So, so if you believe that others will contribute, that does cause you to contribute more. And that helps contribute to this discussion, no pun intended, about why exactly people decide to do what's in the collective interest and cooperate and contribute to the public good. Mm -hmm. And then some of the insight that we get from these experimental studies on how people actually make decisions in these games. I know that there's a lot to game theory in terms of the theoretical aspects, in terms of just 
pure mathematics, etc. And it's interesting for me to wonder, are there any assumptions that you see in the theoretical side of these models that when you test in the lab, well, now you don't have to deal with these very precise assumptions and conditions that makes the importance of experimental testing in the lab very prominent? Wow. Yeah, that's that's a big question. And it, it really gets at at least 70 years of economic history. I mean, John Nash got, and John Nash was the topic of the movie, A Beautiful Mind. He's really credited with, with getting game theory going 70 years ago. And in his version of game theory, everyone is self-interested and they act in a strategic manner concerned only with their own payoffs. And so that's game theory's history. But you do decision-making experiments in the lab, and it's just so obvious from people's choices that that's not the only thing that governs behavior. People are definitely thinking about the payoffs of others, maybe how their payoff compares to the payoffs of others. And so by doing decision-making experiments in the lab, it's become clear that it's just not as simple as saying everyone's out to maximize their own payoff. And so that has, it's been healthy, right? I mean, it's not that game theory is wrong. It's, I mean, game theory is a wonderful tool that allows us to figure out what people will do in a wide variety of situations. But we probably have to think about the payoffs a little bit because the vast majority of the empirical evidence shows that people aren't just self-interested. And so when we're modeling their payoffs, we, we probably have to think not just about somebody's own payoff, but also to what extent they might care about others and, and how their situation compares to others. So doing the lab experiments, you know, it's not that it's shown that game theory is wrong. It just shows that we might want to be a little more careful about how we, how we model people's payoffs. Yes, definitely. And then the other aspect of this is what are the differences that we see in conditions that we model in the lab that might be different from the real world? And then if there are major assumptions that are different between the real world and the lab, what is the importance of studying these behaviors in the lab and how can we apply them to real life? Yeah, well, that's a big question too. So Let me start by just commenting on the contrast between the lab and the real world because, you know, obviously the real world is very rich because in the real world you have this rich environment with all of these factors that are present that potentially affect behavior. And ultimately we care about what people do in the real world, but it can be difficult in the real world to identify why people behave in a particular way because they're in this complicated environment with all these things changing at once, and it's so hard to figure out which factors are the driving factors behind their behavior. So so that's the real world. And in the lab, you strip away all the complexity. And so in a way, the lab is a sterile environment that maybe doesn't provide you with the understanding that you want about why people do what they do in the real world. But the benefit of the lab is that allows you to focus on specific factors of interest. And so often what people do is if they're interested in learning about public good contributions, for example, they'll run an experiment in the lab to identify the effects of a particular factor of interest And you can do that in the lab because you have so much control to strip away all the other factors that might matter. And then you find out if a certain factor makes a difference. And then once you know in the lab if that factor matters, then you can go out into the real world and try to test the effect of that factor, sort of already having some insight about how that factor works. And so initially, experimental economists got really excited about doing lab experiments for the sake of doing lab experiments. But in recent years, what we've moved into doing is using a full spectrum of methods where we use the control of the lab to identify factors that we'll later study in the real world, because that's what ultimately we care about. But now we're doing it using insight that we've learned from the the lab. You know, a specific example is that in the lab, you typically strip away all the social factors because you're making decisions over cash in front of a computer screen. 
and maybe you don't know very well the people that you're interacting with. In the real world, when we're thinking about a community, you know, keeping public spaces clean and safe, people have attachments to their community. They have a history. They know the people in the community. And so there are all these social emotional factors that matter as well. And that makes the real world different. But it doesn't mean that some of the factors underlying behavior can't be studied in the lab as well. And in fact, the lab is a very good starting point for understanding why people do what they do. Mm -hmm. And then this gets to the last question I had when it comes to the importance of what we have figured out in this field. And you mentioned how it can reveal a lot of insight into the relationships that we have and how we behave with each other, which is, it has a lot of implications in real life. But then the other side of that coin is, what don't we know still? What are the research gaps that we still see in the topics that we haven't studied in pro-social behavior and how people make decisions? And then also, just personally, what are you just most excited to work on studying in, say, the next five years? Well, there are a few things to talk about there, but there is some overlap. And to some extent, we've touched on this a little bit already. So, so we know that people will be more cooperative if they believe that others will be cooperative. So that's an empirical finding. That's a statistical relationship. We don't quite know yet what the story is behind that empirical relationship, right? So do you cooperate because that's your understanding about what the norm is in your society? Is that why you do it? Or is it because of your preferences for equality? You know, those types of questions, people are working on it, but we don't have clear answers to those questions. And so, you know, I think empirically, we have some sense of which variables matter for the sake of determining cooperative behavior, but we don't have a complete understanding of what the mechanism is regarding the relationships between those variables. And so that's something that I look forward to working on. Over, over the next five years because the research I've done so far feeds into that debate but doesn't really resolve it. And I think it's important that we resolve it because without figuring out stuff like that, we won't really understand why people do what they do. So, you know, the statistics, the statistical relationships between variables is one thing that's helpful, but, you know, for good policy, you really have to understand the why. So, you know, it's not just about are there positive or negative correlations between certain variables? But it's like, what's the, what's the complete explanation as to why those variables have those relationships? That's something that I think is a discipline we have to keep working on and, and that I look forward to working on personally over the medium term, let's call it. All right. Well, I think it's really been interesting to learn about some of the basics of how this field works and talk about all of the different factors involved, talk about the complexities of the results we derive from it, but also keep in mind how much room there still is to learn more insights when it comes to this very important part of our lives. So thank you for making the time to talk to me about this today. Finally, if someone wants to reach out to you to learn more about your work, where might they go? They should Google Alexander Smith economics and they will get hits for both my professional page and my personal page and there are links there to my research. So that, that's probably the easiest way to go. But I, I am faculty at WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts. All right. So I can probably include some of those links there. And I'm sure people can reach out if they're more interested. But thank you again for making the time today. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure.